So the message tonight is called Purifying Blood of God. Purifying Blood of God. So please turn to John chapter 19. And we're going to read a little bit more scripture at the beginning than usual because it's, it's Good Friday. And so we're going to read a little bit of the story. We're going to read uh, John 19 verse 10 to 30. So we're going to read 20, 20 scriptures before we uh, go into the message. But, you know, it's, uh, it's important that we look at what happened to Jesus on our behalf. So John chapter 19, verse 10 to 30. Say amen when you're there. John chapter 19, verse 10 to 30. Let everybody turn there. So John chapter 19 and verses uh, 10 to 30 says as follows. Then saith Pilate unto him, unto him Speakest thou not unto me? Knowest thou not that I have power to crucify thee, and have power to release thee? Jesus answered, Thou couldest have no power at all against me, except he were given thee from above. Therefore he that delivered me unto thee hath the greater sin. And from henceforth Pilate sought to release him. But the Jews cried out, saying, If thou let this man go, thou art not Caesar's friend. Whosoever maketh himself a king speaketh against Caesar. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he brought Jesus forth and sat down in a judging seat in a place that is called the pavement, but in the Hebrew, Gabbatha. And it was the preparation of the Passover and about the sixth hour. And he saith unto the Jews, Behold your king. But they cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate saith unto them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, We have no king but Caesar. Then delivered he him therefore unto them to be crucified, and they took Jesus and led him away. And he bearing his cross went forth into a place called the place of a skull, which is called in Hebrew Golgotha, where they crucified him and two other with him, on either side one and Jesus in the midst. And, and Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross, and the writing was Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. This title then read many of the Jews, for the place where Jesus was crucified was nigh to the city, and it was written in Hebrew and Greek and Latin. Then said the chief priest of the Jews to Pilate, Write not the king of the Jews, but that he said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts to every soldier apart, and also his coat. Now the coat was without seam, woven from the top from the top throughout. They said therefore among themselves, Let us not rend it, but cast lots for it, whose it shall be, that the scripture might be fulfilled which saith, They parted my raiment among them, and for my vesture they did cast lots. These things therefore the soldiers did. Now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Cleophas and Mary, Mary Magdalene, when Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple standing, standing by whom he loved, he saith unto his mother, Woman, behold thy son. Then saith he to the disciple, Behold thy mother. And from that hour that disciple took her into his own home. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, saith thy thirst. Now there, uh, now there was set a vessel full of vinegar, and they filled the sponge with vinegar and put it upon hyssop and put it to his mouth. When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. So here, um, I've wondered for years, you know, like why did he give him vinegar? Well, I understood that part, they were mocking him. But then I was wondering like, why did he actually put, put his mouth to, to probably like a, a very dirty, you know, rag like a, of a sponge full of vinegar and actually drunk it. So, and then, and then the Lord told me today, he said, um, 
a soul, a soul that lives by the, you know, a, a soul that, that, that walks with, with the Lord, okay, that soul is, um, is nourished or, or irrigated with the, with the Word of God. And the Bible says that, you know, that we're washed by, by the Word, we're washed by, by, by the water of the Word. So the Lord says that, you know, as believers, we live our lives you know, as a believer, we should live our lives based on the Word of God and apply it to our lives. So whenever we read the Word of God and really um, apply it and walk in it, you know, it is both the bread of life and the water of life at the same time. And so the Holy Spirit, like that, that river that flows from the throne of God is the Holy Spirit. You know, in heaven, you have God the Father, you have Christ Jesus to his right, then you have the river of life, which is the Holy Spirit. So the Lord told me that Jesus... You know, he took our place. So at that time, he could not drink, you know, of, 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 of the, you know, the, of the living waters, which is the word, which is himself, because he made himself a sacrifice for us. So at that time, he drank of, um, before he said it is finished, he drank of that, um, of that vinegar, because, you know, we know that when, when, when we thirst, you know, nobody will go, oh, I'm thirsty, give me some vinegar to drink, because vinegar increases your thirst. So the Lord told me that that vinegar represented, you know, what we what we take in when we sin, when we when we live a life of sin apart from God. Our soul is like not our soul already is thirsting for God, but because we don't go to God, we go to the world, and sometimes we don't realize it. But by going to the world, we actually go to Satan, even though we don't worship Satan literally. But going to the world, we're actually receiving um, spiritual vinegar in our souls which only makes us thirst more and thirst more and feel like drier and drier spiritually. So the Lord told me that him drinking of that vinegar before he said it is finished represented him actually partaking of sin in the same way that, that, that you know, a life without Christ is life of sin. So he told me that, that sin as a substance, in the same way that, that, that righteousness comes from, from the word of God, and we know when we read the Bible, we, 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 we literally feel our soul, you know, um, you know, we either feel supernatural fire or, and we feel refreshed. Like there is, it's genuine, literal food for our soul. These scriptures in the Bible are alive and all of us who read it know that. And we, we've all been in a season in, in, our, in our walk of faith where we neglected the word. And what happened? We just felt like all dry and empty inside, right? So... A life with the Word of God, okay, is, is a life irrigated by the life of God Himself through the Word, which is Jesus. And so, so Jesus is the Word of God, okay, and and the Holy Spirit is the breath of God. And we know that for for words to be to be to be heard, okay, like our 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 breath has to like our breath carries the sound of our words. So so the Word of God always brings the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit always brings the Word of God. Like it's, you, you can't, you can't separate them. Okay. And then the Father, the Father is like you know, like like they're all the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But the Father is the head. That's why Jesus said, you know, um, like the Father is greater than I am, because if you choose to speak or to or to not speak, okay, you know, like like you you have authority over your words. And the Bible says that that life and death is in the power of the tongue. And that's because we're made in, in God's image. So in other words, we cannot get that life-giving water except that we truly not just receive the sacrifice of Christ on the cross, but we truly live by it, okay? We truly live by it. Now, the Bible says that there's no peace for the wicked. And the reason why there's no peace for the wicked is because the, the, like what wickedness simply is, Wickedness is doing things on like on our own wisdom, on our doing things, you know, um, on our own stubborn ambitions that we never consulted God for. Okay, when we when we look when we look at um, at, at Adam, for example, Adam was completely consumed um, and and walking with God in the cool of the day, and and that is the that that is the state that a person must be in. Okay, to, to truly walk with God, we need to be desiring God's instruction. So in other words, Adam received instruction from, the, like from, from God, uh, the Godhead, in the cool of the day, 
Why? So in the morning, okay, he communed with the Father, received instruction, so that throughout the day he might carry out those instructions. So that's how, you know, um, like the, the Bible tells us that, that he was planted in the garden to, to, to till it, to take care of it. Okay, so the garden that we need to take care of is, is, is um, the word of God in our hearts. Because the word of God is seed, our heart is the ground, and the Bible, Jesus taught that some, some hearts have stones where, which, which, you know, where the word, the word cannot go deeply, and when troubles arise, the word is, the word is burned. So literally, the word is, the, the word is forgotten. Some hearts are like a thorny heart, which the, the seed goes in, okay, is received with joy, then it begins to bear fruit. But the cares of the world, the deceitfulness of riches, and, 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 and other things choke the word so it does not bear fruit to maturity. You have a question? Exactly, exactly. So, so a stony heart, like a stone cannot bear fruit. <laughs> you, you can drop seed on a stone, nothing's going to happen. Okay, so, so for our hearts to no longer be stone, okay, and that's like even way beyond the parable of the sower, like this is just like, it's impossible. So for our hearts to not be stone, number one, we need to come to the feet of the cross, confess our sins, repent, and receive the, uh, Jesus as our Lord and Savior. The word Lord, okay, in Hebrew literally means owner, ruler, and, um, and commander. So now we get insight that when, you know, when Jesus said on that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, and, I'll, and I will say to them, depart from me, I never knew you. The reason is this, many will call him commander, ruler, and then it's going to turn around and say, when did you honor me as your ruler and commander? You know, like you, you did your own thing. So in other words, I mean, like God is gracious, but we need to understand that God is not mocked. Whatsoever man sows, that, that he shall reap. So the message today is we're looking at the cross, and yes, it is grace. It's wonderful. It is grace. But grace has two parts, okay? Um, and before I go deeper into this, actually, I'll, I'll say it down, and I'll expound on the second part later. So grace... Grace, the Bible says we can boldly approach the throne of grace to receive mercy and help in time of need. So grace is not just receiving mercy. Grace, we're saved by grace because we, we received mercy based on the work that Jesus finished for us. But then the second stream of grace, after we get saved, is so that we, we don't, it's, it's supposed to empower us in time of need. What's time of need? Times of temptation, times of tribulation, times of trial. So, so grace, if we don't recognize that grace is for those times, then all our life will just be saying, Lord, forgive me, Lord, forgive me every day. And God will forgive you as long as you truly mean it and truly decide to change. But we need to, to, to wake up to the fact that grace is also help in time of need so that as the years go by, you know, we, the Lord sees us less and less at the you know, in, 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 at, at, the, at the altar of repentance and more and more, okay, at the altar of praise because of grace, okay? So uh, let's continue reading from uh, John 19, 30 to 34. So John 19, 30 to 34, so it says... The Jews, therefore, sorry, when Jesus, therefore, had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. The Jews, therefore, because it was the preparation that the bodies should not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath day, for that Sabbath was a high Sabbath, besought Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. Then came the soldiers and break the legs of the first and of the other, which was crucified with them. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was dead already, they break not his legs. But one of the soldiers with a spear, sorry, but one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side and forthwith came out blood and water. So the Bible says that the life is in the blood, that the life of the flesh is in the blood. So that blood, 
not just when he got pierced, but the blood that, you know, when he was getting like flogged, you know, when the crown of thorn was put, was put on his head, when his beard got ripped, um, like just all the torture that he inflicted on Jesus, like for, because of us, the blood that was being drained, okay, he's, Jesus is, is our Passover lamb. And in the same way that, that, that the Levitical priesthood would, would sacrifice the animal and literally drain the blood on the altar, um, and, and that blood made atonement for sin. In the same way, Jesus didn't lose a bit of his blood, you know, like two two quarters. He 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 allowed himself to be drained completely, okay? Because life is in the blood. And also, because the life is in the blood, and the Bible is very clear that, that nothing defiled can enter God, that God is undefiled. If, if sin enters his presence, okay, like without being being born again, you know, I mean, like if God fully just manifested right now and like we were not saved and he just fully appeared, you know, we, 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 we would die. So in other words, the Lord told me because of that fact, when the Bible says that, that, that the blood makes atonement for our sins, he told me that because nothing under fault can enter God, but his blood is poured on us spiritually, and our spirit is born again, okay, out of darkness, out of sin. And by the way, like, like it's, our spirit is born again, perfect in the image of, of God, but our souls, okay, need to get sanctified over time. Okay, so, so when we get saved or redemption, that's your spirit. When Christ returns, that will be glorification, which will be your body, which is wickedly, desperately sinful. There's no redemption, there's no, <laughs> like you literally need to get a new body. But anyway, so before I continue, so salvation, okay, salvation is by faith through grace, okay, not by works. But then you need to actually live like you need for the now when you're saved, now the next part of God's vision is not just not just to be to, to be saved all your life and never lift a finger to do anything for God. What so salvation is the first part of God's vision, then it is sanctification. So sanctification is is a lifelong um, you know, striving against the flesh by God's grace to be, um, you know, for purity. So it's salvation, sanctification, purification, and purification is when you, when, when, when the Lord is like, okay, like, like you've, it's not that you're perfect in of yourself, but when the Lord says that you're pure, that's when he begins to, 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 to manifest to you. Like, you know, that's why Jesus said, blessed are the pure in the heart, let you all see God. So that means every Christian, it's, it's, not a, it's not people who see visions and angels, whatever. That, it's not because they're better Christians or they just have a gift. It has nothing to do with a gift, okay? It's to do with purification. They, they love God enough that they, that, they, that they sanctify their walk. And God, and like Jesus said, he said, he said um, the love of God is, to, is the keeping of the commandments. And he said, if you obey my commandments, the Father will love you, and we will come and manifest ourselves to you. See, he's already in you, and you already feel his presence. But the, the word manifest means that, that like we will make sure you see us. When we're worshiping, I saw for the third time, a, a light came there again. And, and, and I, I, I could see the new people were a bit confused. <laughs> <laughs> they, 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 were, they kept looking there and it was actually really brighter than ever before but I'll, I'll just explain what happened so tonight will be the third time yeah. but twice in our church already like like we we had a light uh, just a supernatural light manifest and apparently from tonight it was just, it, it just it's getting brighter and brighter like I was I was playing the guitar and then I, I just I just see like a really bright light like like it's been more intense than before and then he left after about three seconds then I, I I look around. I see the new people just like looking at. That. <laughs> so you're not crazy. You're not crazy. We we all side with you, and it's the third time it happens. So that's God manifesting Himself. Okay, and Jesus said, like you know, uh, the love of God is the keeping of the commandments, and those who keep my commandments will be loved of the Father, will be loved of the Father, and we will come to Him and manifest ourselves to Him. So for that light to, 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 to have come and for, you, and for you to have seen it, that means the Lord sees in your heart that, that you, have a, you have a hunger to go deeper. That's why you saw that light. That was Christ himself, the light of the world.
Okay. And, and I know I look re relaxed about it, but it's because, you know, like, like in the same way that, that the angels in heaven are not like, wow, you know, look, God, the angels. In the same way, I'm getting used to that. I see angels every day, praise God. And but but this message is to make you realize that God's plan of salvation is not just getting saved and waiting to, to die to go to heaven. Like that's not what it is. It's getting saved. So you're you you you're when God looks at you, he sees Jesus. So you're in the right fellowship with the, with the Father. And now the second plan or the second gear after salvation is the quest for sanctification. And sanctification comes by by simply spending more time with God than the world, okay? Like we know that, you know, we're all born addicted to the world. Even if, if, even if, you, if you look at a baby that looks so innocent and, 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 and whatever, but try to remove their toy and you'll see sin manifest, okay? So, so, so we, we all need salvation. <laughs> even a cute baby is, needs Jesus, okay? So, <laughs> but... Where was I? Okay, yes. So salvation by faith, then we need to understand that the second part of God's vision after salvation is to get sanctification. Sanctification is, is don't worry, you, you have your whole life to get sanctified. Some will get more than others. And that's why Jesus said that, that those who keep his commandments and teach others to keep them will be called great in the kingdom. And those who don't will be called least in the kingdom. So literally the level to which you sanctify yourself is level to which God will reward you in heaven. So, so, but it's not it's not a competition between us. It's a competition. It's, it's, it's a race to God. Okay, that's why Paul says, "Run as someone who who wants to obtain the price." So, never think it's a competition between between each other. No, it's a it's it's, it's um, drawing close to God, and God will draw close to you to the degree that you draw close to Him. And there's no limit. Paul said we go from glory to glory forever and ever. So even in heaven, even when Christ returns and makes a new heaven and new earth, even then we'll forever, you know, it'll be easier to like, we'll have no more, no more uh, uh, sinful flesh. But even then in perfection, we'll forever get closer and more understanding and wisdom about God. So that's what, that's what I love about God. Like there's no one day like, okay, that's the maximum. Then we get all bored again. We'll always go from glory to glory with God. So when, so when the Bible says that the life is in the blood, the Lord told me, he, he gave me the, the, the mental image. He said, because I'm, uh, nothing can defile me, I'm too holy. So when the blood is poured upon us, upon our spirits, he said, what happens is that the reason why we get purified is he told me it's because in the same way when, when, when you take a positive magnet and a negative ma magnet, and if you put the magnet down, you just like go close, it just pushes, it just pushes, it never touches. He told me because his life is in the blood of Jesus, when the blood gets applied by faith over us, okay, he said what happens is that his life comes into our spirit, and just like a, a, a positive magnet, it pushes away the negativity of sin out of our spirit. And so our spirit is completely pure, completely pure, like, like once you're saved by faith. And, but now you have to sanctify your soul. And, and so that's why, um, you know, that's why it's so important to feed ourselves with the word of God, because if there's more, if there's more world coming into us in as many ways that can happen, like, you know, TV shows we shouldn't be watching, you know, like you should always ask God, okay, is this, is this okay with you before you do anything? And the reason why, like uh, in Proverbs, Solomon said, lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways, he didn't say sometimes, he says in all your ways, acknowledge God and he will direct your path. Another scripture says, commit thy works unto the Lord and thy thoughts will be established. In other words, God wants to be in everything you do. He wants to be everywhere you go. And by the way, just the Bible says that, that hell and death are before the Lord, how much more the hearts of men. So as a Christian, don't think that because, you know, you, 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 you walk somewhere where, where there's sin that like God is winning at the door. No, God is there with you and, and it's like, you know, just tapping you for like what, sometimes for hours until you're like, okay, I shouldn't be, I shouldn't be here. 
I'm telling you, if you just would acknowledge God in all your ways before making decisions, you'd be surprised at how well you would hear God. Because God wants to guide you, just like he, just like he guided Adam and Eve. Okay, and by the way, the word Eden in the in, like the the word Eden means delight, which means that the Bible says, "Delight yourself in the Lord, and He will give you the desires of your heart." In other words, um, you know the, what Adam and Eve truly lost, truly, truly, truly uh, lost. It was more than just the physical garden; it was the presence of God. It was the Holy Spirit. Okay, the Bible says that the, the, the kingdom of heaven is not eating and drinking, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. So it was really the Holy Spirit beyond the beautiful garden that they lost. So now in Christ, we have the Holy Spirit again. So now he says, okay, now that I'm back in your life, he says, now delight in me. In other words, like, like, like he's saying, cultivate my presence. He's saying, till the garden in your heart with my word, pluck out the weeds. Okay. One time, the Lord gave me a vision of like of like mushrooms, and in, He knows I don't like mushrooms. And then I, I said, like, I'm not, I don't like the vision. What like what what does that mean? And then He said, those, those are seeds of sin in your heart that I want you to to, to pluck out. And then I said, okay, like how do I pluck it out? And He said, just say in Jesus' name, I remove every seed of sin from my heart uh, in Jesus' name. And when I said that, I literally felt something like break off. It was a time not really, really painful, but it was, I felt like a discomfort and something just like got removed. So, but think about this. If you live a life, you know, and, and where your, your Bible is only read at church or like even worse, maybe once a month, imagine, imagine the state of your heart, like your garden. God wants us to, to, to sow good things in there and pluck out, pluck out like you know, just just say by faith when 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 you when you repent, don't, don't just repent. Say in Jesus' name, I remove every seed, every 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 growth of sin from my heart, because your heart is the garden that He wants to, to till above. You know, just giving you outside blessings, because the fruits of the spirit, the fruits of the spirit, is the foundation of of of, of any true blessing. Because the fruits of the spirit, uh, in you know. In another study, like those those things, love, uh, joy, peace, gentleness, meekness, temperance, um, you know, all those things, you know, uh, I did a study and it's just virtue. And see, Jesus, uh, the woman, there was a woman with an issue of blood that touched his garment. And the Bible says he felt virtue come out of him. And I did a study and, and all those fruits of the spirit are counted for virtue. Okay, so so that's virtue. So in other words, if you want to be blessed, don't look for outside blessings. Till till your garden first, and the rest will flow, including including healing. Okay, because the virtue that left. Think about it. God is a spirit, and 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 if you felt the virtue leave, that means you felt the Holy Spirit move, and those are called the fruits of the spirit. Okay, so those fruits are 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 the 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 character traits of the Holy Ghost. So, what, so when he says he felt virtue leave him and he stopped and saying, who touched, who touched my, my garment, that means he felt the Holy Spirit move and heal. In other words, we need to be less focused on, on and, and God wants to bless you outside and inside, don't get me wrong. But what I'm saying is the foundation is to, folk, to till the garden of our hearts with the word of God and to protect, to protect it. You know, to be careful about our, our environment. So God is just going deeper than just I'm saved tonight. Like he wants to let you know what's the plan. Like what is the end goal of the cross? So the blood of Jesus has defeated Satan, sin, death, and hell. Okay. But in our lives, it can defeat sin over time. If we truly have communion with God, okay? And communion is more than just taking the cup at the end and just say, like, I'm communing with God, you know, I'm good. Then going home and, and just putting, putting I don't know, <laughs> putting a show you shouldn't be watching or a movie, like, full of violence. You know, the Bible says that 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 um, that, that, the, the, that the, violent, the violent man is an abomination to God. So, so we, we need to we need to like really rethink like what we enjoy for for our pastime, okay? 
So the Greek meaning of communion, there's, there's many of them, but one of them is relationship. So when we take communion, that the bread and the cup, you know, it, it's a symbol of a deeper thing. So communion is not just that when Jesus said, whenever you meet, you know, like do communion to remember me. He, he was saying way, way, way more than whenever you meet, do a ritual, you know, with bread, bread and wine. What he was saying is that be, you know, let the Holy Spirit lead you to the point that when you meet with other believers, you know, that fellowship just gets deeper and, and, and more meaningful. Because think about it, if, if, if the kingdom of heaven is within the Holy Spirit, righteousness, peace, and joy within the Holy Spirit, that means that we don't need to wait to go to heaven to experience that fellowship. The fellowship of the Holy Spirit is not about you taking communion and going home or just a blessing. The fellowship of the Holy Spirit is about us learning to live as genuine brothers and sisters because the Bible says that, that God is the Father of light from whom all family come from. So, you know, we really need to understand that we are as much family in the Spirit as our, as our blood relatives. We are all born again of the same Holy Spirit, okay? We are sons and daughters of God, and, but we can't stop there. Like just, I'm, I'm saved by faith, I'm a son and daughter of God, then what? <laughs> okay, there's a bigger, there's a vision that God has. It's, it's not like, it's, this is not the end and be all and wait to die. After that, God wants sanctification. Why? Do you realize that the Bible says that our reward on earth is holiness? Why? God is holy. And the Bible doesn't say that God has blessings. He says God is blessed. That's why he, he gives you his presence as, as, as like, you know, the first fruit of your blessings. Because he is the blessing. Okay, so that means if he's the blessing and his holiness, then that means that like our focus needs to be on him above above anything else, above food and above water, you know, because, and, and, and now we begin to understand why the Bible says, seek ye first the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness. Why? The righteousness is within, the righteousness is the foundation of the kingdom. The Bible says that, that the scepter of your kingdom is the scepter of righteousness. What is righteousness? Righteousness is actually, righteousness is actually like a, a, a government term. It's, it's not a religious term at all. Righteousness simply means to be in right standing with the government. Just like if I go outside, when, when I will leave this uh, building, I'm not going to drive on, a, on the left side of the road and then be, and then like when, when the police stops me, I'm like, why? I never go anywhere in life. Why? I don't have a... And I'm not going to start saying, God, like, why do things never work out? And then, and then like, you know, it's the same thing in the spiritual realm. We, we need to actually apply the word of God so things actually, we get to our destination. The, the reason why God is saying, not, not in anger, but God is saying that the reason why some, some, of, some of your plans don't get to fruition, is not because God doesn't want to bless your plans. As a matter of fact, the Bible says, commit your works or commit your plans unto God and your thoughts will be established. Like, and, and King David said, may the, Lord, may the Lord prosper your plans. So number one, God is not against your plans. God wants to make sure that your plans are in line with his will first, okay? And then, if it's not against his will in general, then he doesn't mind you being creative with your life. But he, the reason why, um, you know, in the same way that I can't, I can't be stubbornly driving on, on the left side of the road and then, and, then, and then always be angry at the authority because I, I, I never get home, <laughs> okay? In the, same, in the same way, we can't, ignore God's word and then wonder why, you know, we, we go in circles. Okay, so I'll just give you a, a very simple example. The children of Israel, God took them out of Egypt. It's the same thing as God taking us out of sin. Okay, but then they wanted to go back to Egypt. So, so we're, not, we're not saved so we can just tolerate sin. We're saved so we can you know, like Jesus said, let your kingdom come, let your will be done, let your kingdom, kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. We're saved. So once again, like Adam before the fall, we can be ministers. That, again, that's not a religious term, that's a government, gov government term. We can be ministers of bringing his kingdom on earth from glory to glory. 
So the Greek word for, for communion is relationship. So through genuine relationship with the Lord and, you know, God is light, the world is darkness, and there's no fellowship between light and darkness. So we don't need a voice from heaven to let us know if we're truly walking in, 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 in communion. We all know if we just, okay, the, the Bible says there's no fellowship. Okay, communion actually means relationship. And the Bible says that there's no relationship or communion with, with light and darkness. God is light. So throughout my days, like where am I? In a light or in a light or in a darkness? So don't raise your hand to answer. <laughs> we all know. But God is saying that it, it is very simple to um, to know where you stand and it's not angry, but it's just saying today, I'm letting you know how to position yourself to not just say I'm saved and be thankful, rightfully so, but to say I'm saved. Now I'm going to align myself with God's vision for salvation. Okay. Let's turn... Sorry, and, and also, so the world is darkness, God is light. His kingdom is light, the world's kingdom is darkness. And so God says, another question to ask yourself is, do I blend in, like when, I, when, I'm, when I'm amongst the world, do I just blend in or do I stand out? God said, ask yourself that. When I'm, when I'm, like when I'm not in church, and that includes at home with your family, he says like, you know, when you're in the world, because we're, we're in the world, but not of the world, so we can't escape this world until Christ returns or takes us home. So, but ask yourself, do I blend in or do I stand out? And by stand out, I don't mean like, you know, be in your face about that. I'm just saying, are you ashamed of Jesus or are you standing for Jesus? Okay. And again, don't cast your pearls before swine. That simply means like, Make sure that what you're about to say, even for Jesus, even 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 to even to stand for God, make sure God says it's the time to say it. Don't just say things all the time without restraint and then blame God when you get wounded. Make sure <laughs> that God said it's the time and it's the right thing to say at that time. Okay, because tribulation will come, but make sure you ask God before you speak about about him. Yes. Well, I, I, th I think I, if I understand your question properly, you're asking like why some people make you feel like you have to go do stuff. Okay, well, number one, don't try to be like anybody else. Be, okay, the reason, when, when Solomon said, in all your ways, acknowledge, acknowledge God, and he will direct your path. So some things we're all called to do, like, like you know, the Great Commission. But we, 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 we are all unique individuals, and we all have unique ways of going about doing things. So don't just try to copy what you see. It's way more effective and to actually do things in God's grace. By that I mean, you know, make sure like it's, it's okay. Jesus said, I say I do nothing un unless I see the Father doing it. So in other words, don't just do what you know is right to do. Wait for God's timing on everything. Okay. And God's timing doesn't guarantee that, for example, if I if God says it's time to talk to, you know, to this person on the street about God and I do it, just because it's God's timing doesn't mean he will receive me or, or receive Jesus. It just means it's the time that he'll be affected enough that even if he re rejects rejects Jesus through you, that when he or she goes home, they'll they'll keep they'll keep thinking about it and God will like 
hold them, um, um, God will convict them about it. So, you know, so long story short, don't just copy what you see in a church. Make sure you spend time in the word of God and in prayer and listen to God. And, you know, if you're not sure about God's voice, God will never say anything outside of his word, number one. Number two, God's voice is, is like, you know, usually 90% of the time not audible. I've heard it audible three times in my life only, but usually it's like a still small voice, you know, from, from the inside. It's like spirit to spirit. And, it, you know, it's, it's very still, it's very calm. Even if, even if God is, you know, rebuking me sometimes, like I still feel it's like a, there's a lot of peace in it and it's biblical. But all that to say, what I'm trying to say is that make sure that you do things with your giftings and with God's timing. And that will easily come if you just spend time with God more than the world. Like it, 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 it'll flow. The, the reason why m many of us um, or people don't hear, they don't, they don't feel like they hear God enough is because they don't give him enough time. It's that, it's that simple. So does that answer your question? Yes, that's okay, praise God. So let's turn to Leviticus 17, verse 11. Leviticus 17 and verse 11. Leviticus 17 and verse 11. So Leviticus chapter 17, 11 gives us the foundation of why Jesus had to shed his blood for us. It says, for the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement, to make an atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. So, and that explains why he had to become flesh to save us, because you know, God decreed that it is the blood that makes an atonement for the soul. So that being said, um, the Lord led me to, to do like a Hebrew search for the meaning of uh, life. And again, there's just so many definitions, but he made this one jump at me. He said, like one of the meaning for the word life uh, it literally is spirit of life. So that makes this verse read like this in, in Hebrew. For the spirit of life, for the sorry, for the spirit of life, sorry, for the spirit of life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. In other words, when we take communion, okay, so that that the 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 drinking the the, the wine or the juice and the and eating the the bread which is the flesh. Okay, the Bible says that that the blood, that the, the flesh of Jesus that, that, that was ripped by, 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 the, by the whipping, that it was like the veil opening, and the blood was like, you know, the purity and the life of God itself uh, redeeming us. So that, that's, that's why the veil was torn. That veil represents the, like the, the, the bread or the, or the flesh of Jesus. So, in other words... We need to follow the leading of the Holy Spirit to truly have communion, and now we know that communion means relationship. So we need to we need to follow the leading of the Holy Spirit as a lifestyle to truly have relationship with Jesus's blood, um, so that we will not hear "Depart from me, I never knew you," because that verse, as a pastor, makes me understand the importance of making people understand we're saved by faith. And it's not easy to lose your salvation, but we need to understand what it what does it mean, okay, to walk in the spirit. Walking in the spirit, okay, literally. And actually, I felt I felt compelled by the Lord to share a testimony when I was in my maybe in my in my teens. So I grew up in a Protestant, like we're not in our missional church, but I grew up in a Protestant Protestant church. So I knew. As far as I can remember, like I believe in in Jesus, so I, I guess I heard it like when I was very very young, because I don't remember like walking to the altar and like saying I gave my life to Jesus. I will I will start the faith by my parents. Um, but then in high school, I think I really received the Holy Spirit. <laughs> to be honest with you, that I actually felt I received the Holy Spirit after asking, you know, really seeking God. 
But then I actually felt in, uh, in my teen years, the Holy Spirit leave me. I actually felt it. And it's because I was living in rebellion. Like I, I had the Holy Spirit. Um, it was very clear. I felt it like, you know, cause I, cause when I was in high school and i and I began to like be tired with life, like I, I cried out to God and I told him, you know, I read your word and I, and I see people who, die, who give their lives and died for you. But I told him like, I don't feel like I would die for you. And I, I just want what they had. And then very long story short, um, the Lord actually appeared to me like he just he looked like pure light like a person made of light and then he transformed into light again and then just like shot inside of me like a beam of light and then I felt for the first time like okay I have the Holy Spirit so so that means I was not even saved before and anyways so after that I was living well before that but even after that I wasn't I didn't really know the Bible I, I didn't have the fear of the, the Lord really because I grew up just in a family that you know, believed in God, but I was never really, I didn't know, anyways, I didn't know much, but I was like living a, not a good lifestyle, you know, doing drugs and everything, partying, and then one day I literally felt the Holy Spirit just leave me, and I just felt worse than before I received it, and that's when I, <laughs> that's why I learned the fear of the Lord, you know, I'm not saying I have to live in fear of God, but that's, that's when for the first time I can say I begin to fear God, I'm like, wait a minute, like, and 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 I was and I was even high when I felt it leave me. So I was just like, my goodness, like I'm not in a good position right now. And so I repented and I cried cried to God. I stopped smoking uh, marijuana, and I was crying out to God for like almost three weeks until He finally came back. And when He came back, that's when I I, I realized I can't just like because I have the Holy Spirit. I can do whatever I want, like do drugs. Like that's when. So I learned I learned in in my in my late teens early 20s that you know the holy spirit like you know it's not just like he's here to stay no matter what you do so i i lived it all that to say that you know we need to nobody is perfect and again the throne of the throne of grace is available for to get mercy in in, in up in time of need nevertheless you know god's plan is not just to save us and wait to to we'll die god's plan is to save us and conform us to the image of christ Okay, that's the vision. God wants to conform us to the image of Christ. So if anybody ever asks you, what's the vision of the cross? See, we'll never ask that question. The vision of the cross is to, to conform us to the image of his son. So Jesus didn't walk around just saying, I'm, I'm the son of God, so I can do whatever I want. Like, let me just live. No, he, because he was the son of God, he, he, he was an ambassador of God of how we should live. So to be conformed to his image, means that God has a vision for the cross and the vision is to over time don't worry like you have all your life but the Lord told me this one time and I've already told the congregation every year you should look at your life and say okay am I growing in the fruits of the spirit like do, do I love people more do I have more patience do I do am I more gentle with people so every year ask yourself okay like look at the fruits of the spirit in Galatians chapter 5 and ask yourself every year, okay, like, <laughs> did I lose patience? Then do I have less patience than the last year? Do I have less love, less meekness? Or do I actually, or am I actually growing? Okay, we should ask ourselves that. The Bible says if we judge ourselves, we should not be judged. Okay, so, so all those scriptures are not there, you know, just to like decorate the Bible. They're there <laughs> because, because it's the word of God. But, but, you know, but anyways, so this message today is a celebration of the cross and of God's mercy. Okay, don't, don't lose that. God, God is happy. I'm, I'm just so God, God is happy with you. Um, but it's just telling you his vision for the cross. Okay, so you don't just like aimlessly just like wonder about your life with God. Okay. So let's turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 11 to 14. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, 11 to 14. Yeah. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 11 to 14.
2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 11 to 14. And this is what Paul says, you know, as a conclusion to his teaching. He says, Finally, brethren, farewell. Be perfect. Be of good comfort. Be of one mind. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace shall be with you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the saints salute you. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the, and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Amen. So I want to focus here on verse, um, by the way, let's talk about perfect. Don't, don't freak out. The Bible says that he who began a good work in you shall perfect it or complete it until his return. So when Christ returns, he will complete the work, okay? So it's not up to you to be like, I need to be perfect. You, it's up to you to be I, like, I desire, um, I hunger and thirst for righteousness. Jesus said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness because they will be filled. So in other words, to, to be, you know, to, to, to become sanctified, Jesus told us the the beginning of that is actually like a hunger for it. You have a question? Exactly. And like once we become saved, like we're perfect, but in Christ, but we're still in, in Christ. And like what keeps us in that righteous stance, that right standing is like one, that righteousness. Exactly. It, it, it's like a continual thirst for righteousness. See, like that's why at the beginning of the message, God explained like you know drinking the water of life or or the or the or or, or um the sin of you know shown by through the vinegar that he drank. So, so like living a life of thirst for Jesus is a sign that you're healthy. It's not, it's not like how, you know, how holy are you than, 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 than your neighbor. It's like, it's like, are you still thirsty for God? Then, then keep going. You're doing good. So like that definition of perfection, that means that's supposed to happen. That, that definition of it will happen. But when Christ returns, it will complete. And the reason why it'll be complete is because like he will give us a new body. Like right now, our body is like, is it like it's like the the secret spy in your life that's just like always sabotaging all your plans and always fighting you. The Bible says that the flesh is desperately wicked. There's no hope for the flesh. That's yes. Perfect. That's perfect. Um, I'll be really short with this because somebody who was a Christian posted something on Facebook a while ago saying like, oh, trying to give people advice or whatever, saying like, oh, love your imperfections, but like inside me, it kind of cringed. I'm like, isn't the point like to like. No, 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 like God, God hates sin. Yeah, and, and, if, and, if we're, and if we're, if we're made in the image of God originally and we're being sanctified the back of that image, we're not supposed to love our imperfection. Like we're, 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 but we're not, okay, like when we sin, as long as we're like truly sorry and God is not, you can't, we can't fool God. If we're truly, honestly sorry, God will forgive us. But we have to remember that, that we need to thirst for righteousness and we need to be, Really, like, we can't spend one day not in a word because that word nourishes your spirit. And the more your spirit is nourished, the more it can fight the flesh off. So that means that, like, you know, if you feed your, your, your flesh more than the spirit, that's when you always feel like, why can I never break from that sin? But if you start to, to actually feed with the word of God more and with worship time and prayer time more than just doing worldly things, that's when you'll begin to break out of those habits. Yes? Um, what does it mean to be forgiven in Christ or like, um, uh, what, what does it mean to say it's like, I'm not going to be righteous in Christ? And yeah, we're forgiven in Christ. Yes. Um, so it's not up to us, but it's... Yeah, but we remain perfect in Christ, but, and we remain perfect in Christ, but, and there's a flash as well. Right? Yes, so we made perfect in Christ because our spirit is born again. So, so your spirit is perfect right now. If you have, if you have faith in Christ, your spirit, that's the part of you that's like perfect. And that's why the, the Holy Ghost lives in that part of you. So, but, but now your soul is a part of you that, that has a free will to lean with the spirit or lean with the flesh. And so you leaning with the spirit more and more is called sanctification over time. And, and, and so you leaning more and more with, with, with the spirit, like it actually transforms your soul. It actually transforms it. So your soul is already saved through your spirit being born again. But but like the more you lean with the, the spirit over the flesh, 
the more your soul will feel the, the glory that's already in your spirit. And that's why when you obey God more than it's obeyed, that's why you actually feel more pure. You, you feel a difference. That's because you, like your soul is allowing your, your spirit, like your soul is like, like a stepping into what your spirit is already feeling. And that's why when you sin, you feel terrible because like then you're just like back in the flesh again and just feel like ah oh, like what's you know <laughs> so 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 sanctification is is the process the lifelong process of of like you know through your, your own will of and following God by spending more time with God in the world. What happens over time is that you your 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 soul leans more and more with the spirit, which is already perfect. That makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Amen. And and by the way, and that's why when uh, Christ returns, like we have different levels of reward. It, it's because your reward will, will reflect how much you allow yourself to be sanctified. That, that's, why they, they'll, that's why they'll vary. Um, yeah, the, the world is like I'm challenged, right? Like um, five, the person that five talents got five talents versus two talents got two talents versus one just kept his and grabbed it. Yeah, like that's another dimension of reward. So, so there's rewards just based on how close you allow yourself to walk with God. And then there's rewards on on how on how well you um, stewarded your, your 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 gifting. So there's it's it's like two different plane, it's two different dimensions of reward, but both. But so that, that's why before your giftings are even used, you have to like be right with God, right? Yeah, right with God by Jesus. Exactly, exactly. Just just think think of a branch cut off. That's what happens when we don't, when, I, when we don't read the Bible. We're cut off and there's no fruit. That's why we feel dry and we're just like dying. So being in the Word every, every day, that's how the sap keeps flowing. And over time, the Bible says, there's a parable uh, that, that the kingdom of heaven is like a person who sowed seed in the field. And then they went and sleep and, went, and, they, and they don't know how, but the, it's just the, the, the seed grew and then just like bare fruit over time. If you just abide, okay, the fruit will just grow by itself. Just like if, if you... You know, if you look at a tree right now, you'll be like, that, that tree is going to hell. Like, there's nothing good on the tree. But that tree is still planted. So, so, so in due season, we'll see that a tree, you know, was really in God. And in the same way, the world cannot yet see that we're in God. But when, but when Christ returns, they will see that we were always planted. Mm -hmm. So, ex ex it explains your question? Yes, it does. Okay. Okay, so... Um, Okay, let's read, the, let's read it again so I remember where I was. Finally, brethren, farewell, be perfect. Oh yeah, so we've been perfection is up to us. We just have to abide and the fruit of perfection will, 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 will just flow. So finally, brethren, farewell, be perfect, uh, be of good comfort, be of one mind, live in peace, and the God of love and peace shall be with you. The only way we can be of one mind is if we all individually follow the Holy Spirit. If the, if the church truly did that, there be there wouldn't be there wouldn't be a thousand denominations. Okay? The the very simple answer for to unity is if each one of us individually we learn to go to God about everything, and after we heard what God want to go with it. If we if we do that individually between us and God, when we come together, there'll be unity because the spirit is not divided. So so. To be, un to be unified, we, we actually need to, on our own time with God, be real with God. So, um, so greet one another with a holy kiss. All the saints salute you. The grace, okay, let's read this very slowly. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Amen. So this is like, you know, the vision of the cross. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and love of God. So here the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ is associated with the love of God. Okay. So for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that, that whosoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. So we all know that we're saved by grace, which is the love of God. It's none of, none of our own works. But there's more. It says, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. So we can't separate them. The grace of God, the, the, sorry, the, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, 
brought us to the, to the love of God experientially, like, you know, like we're back in right standing with God because our spirits are born again and now we're perfect in spirit. And now he says, and this is the part we, have, we must not forget, and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. It's not just what we're about to do, taking communion. That part we saw in Hebrew, communion means relationship. So it's saying the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the relationship of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Amen. That's the answer to unity. That's the answer to defeat sin. That's the answer to living a victorious life. Because the Bible says that, that, that um, whatsoever is born of God overcomes the world. Overcoming the world means to be no longer under the power of sin. You can be saved, but you can be bound by sin. I'll, I'll give an example. Like um, last week, uh, during the message, God gave us an example that getting saved is like immigrating to a new country. Okay? So, but to be free in that country, like, so you can... You can go to a new country, and then and then you can break every law there is, and you'll you'll still be a citizen, but you're going to be in jail. Do you feel blessed in jail? <laughs> you can be a, you can be a citizen, but be in jail, or you can be a citizen that that uh, we were talking about spiritual warfare last week. You can be a citizen of the country, but because you know you don't do what God says and put on the armor of God so you can stand the evil you know and fight against the enemy spiritually not physically the, the Lord gave us the example that it's like you come to a new country but then you allow some 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 wicked villain to just tie you to a tree and you just don't do anything you're like oh I don't need to do spiritual warfare I'm good I'm saved you know and the whole time people walk by you like like do you know if you can enjoy that you can, you, can, you can enjoy the whole country. Why, why, why do you stay here? And you're like, I'm saved. I don't need to do spiritual warfare. I'm good. <laughs> you know? So we need to understand that those things that Bible, the Bible tells us in New Covenant are not suggestions. <laughs> they are keys of the kingdom to experience all the blessings of the kingdom. Okay, so you can be saved by faith, but be in bondage. And that's what sin is. It's bondage. And God doesn't want you to just be, a, 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 you know, a citizen of the kingdom. He wants you to be a citizen of the kingdom, just going going to and fro, enjoying the whole kingdom. Not just on the tree saying, oh, that is, it's so beautiful, the grass, the trees, the, you know, the, the sky. He wants you to be free. Okay, yes. Yes, because Jesus said that, um, you know, that to us is given the keys of the kingdom. He didn't say the key. He said the keys. So in other words, let's say, let's say that, um, you know, you immigrate to a country where you're like adopted as like the, the, the king's son. And then because of the king's son, you have access to, to, every, to every building, you know, it's, it, it all belongs to you. So, so, you know, that king tells you, okay, in this room, okay, it's the Bible for us. He says, in this room, here are all the keys that open every building in this country. Okay, but you don't, you don't even, you never go to that room. You have no idea what, key, what keys are there and what it opens. So, you are the son of the king. You are the richest son of the whole land. But you live like a poor man because, and by, I don't mean... I'm not talking about money here, but you're living like a poor man in blessings, like blessing we're talking about, because you don't know what the keys are. And and sometimes even when you know, you don't actually apply it. So that means like you've, you've seen the key, you heard the key, but you don't actually take it and, and actually open the door of, of that key because taking the key and opening the door is actually a walking in the word, not just hearing it, but walking in it. But your faith in in the in the, in the king that adopted you is, is strong, and he'll never forsake you. But nevertheless, you're waiting to 
to die to, to actually take the keys when he's saying, listen, I didn't say, pray our Father word in heaven, take me to heaven. He said, pray our Father word in heaven, let your, will, let your kingdom come, let your will be done here as over there. So in other words, um, you, can be, like, you can be saved, but you can still be bound. And, and, and bondage is, is usually because of either ignorance or because of, because of, of sin and because God is righteous God cannot, um, you're, you're saved, but God cannot fully reward, reward you because, you know, if God did that, then he would break his word. You have a question? Is that, sorry, is that good enough? Okay, go ahead. Yeah. Yes. Or like being in a cage uh, or in a jail cell, and the door is unlocked and it's open, but you need to step out. Yes, and and that that comes to like your thinking, because many many believers are saved, but they're not thinking like the word yet. So because of because of the, the the thinking is not aligned with the word, even though they're saved, there's many blessings they don't experience because they don't actually think like the word. And thinking like the word that's actually like like part of uh, it's the first step of actually using a key. For example, the Bible says that you know um, whatsoever you shall ask in my name that sh that you will receive. But any another word, another scripture says that whatever you ask, don't doubt because when you doubt, it's like being a wave, obviously tossed to and fro, and don't expect to receive. So in other words, when we pray and then we doubt what we ask because it's taken like longer than we expected. It's not because it's not coming. It's because there's, there's, a, there's a timing of God. And there's a promise that it will come. But we need to be patient. Because God works in, in the Bible says his ways. And his thoughts are higher than, than, than our ways and thoughts. As much as the heavens are higher above the earth. So when we pray for stuff. And it's not in our timing. We, we, don't, we should never assume it's not coming. Or I'm not holy enough. God never said be holy to that degree. And I'll answer your prayer. He never said that. He said, because you're my child, ask and it shall come. But then we but then the enemy comes and says, Oh, you're not holy enough. So so that so so that's so what you're talking about is like the you know, you have a the train is broken, but you carry it or you stay in, in a prison when the door is open. That that's due to not aligning our thinking with the word. That's when that happens. That is your answers your question. Amen. So so yes. So like we saw. Communion is relationship. So the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. That's what the Bible says that those whosoever walks by the Spirit are the sons of God or daughters of God. The reason why is because the Holy Spirit, again, the Holy Spirit is the kingdom. In other words, we need to not live according to our own plans, but according to the Holy Spirit's leading. Number one, the foundational thing of that is the word. I'll give an example of God's voice that, that most of us ignore or don't realize God speaks to us. Jesus said, I will send the Holy Spirit and he will, uh, the comforter, and he will teach you in all things. And he will remind you what I've said to you. Okay. So. Um, actually, the Lord is not telling me to share this. One of the definitions of, um, you know, uh, the Holy Spirit teaching you all things in Hebrew says, and the scholarship, so this verse says, and the scholarship of the Holy Ghost be with you. Where says communion? One, one meaning is relationship. Another meaning is scholarship. So he's saying, and the scholarship of the Holy Ghost be with you all. The reason why there's so many denominations is because we don't let the Holy Spirit teach us. We we, we just say, you know what, I like this to mean this, and that's what, like, no, we can't do that. We need to let the Holy Spirit teach us, and you'll find that you're, you'll always be learning. And, and when you let the Holy Spirit lead you, no, revelation abounds because God is all-knowing. So when revelation stops, it's because you've, you've somewhere in your life, you stopped allowing the Holy Spirit to, to teach you above men. I'm not, teach, I'm not teaching um, division. I'm just letting you know that you should never take the word of the um, you, sh you should never take 
a man of God over Scripture. And you should never take a man of God, his word, over what you know the Holy Ghost told you, which is backed by the word of God. If you know that Scripture says something, but you just submit yourself to a man or woman of God, when you, or when you know that the word, well, I'm not saying to, to, to just be divided, divided, I'm just saying when you know it doesn't align, you, it's between you and God to align yourself with the word. I'm not saying you have to leave the church, whatever. I'm just saying when it comes to those situations, it will be before God, it's your responsibility when it comes to that, to align yourself with the word. I'm not saying to start a division or whatever, you know, just keep unity, but between you and God, align what you know to align. So, um, so the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. So in other words, there is no heaven without the Holy Spirit. And before Christ returns, he's training us all to, 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 to allow the Holy Spirit to teach us, to allow the Holy Spirit to guide us, to allow the Holy Spirit to comfort us, to be our best friend, to allow the Holy Spirit to to open to open you know the, 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 those kingdom gates of, of, of blessings. And God says this every time. So see, Jesus said the Holy Spirit will remind you what He said. So whenever you're in a situation, either at work or in the family or or wherever. And then whatever you're going through, then you just have like a, a, a memory of a scripture. And the scripture, you, you didn't hear a voice. You just had a memory of a scripture. And the scripture just happens to be exactly relevant to, what, to what's happening around you. That's not you just remembering randomly. That's the God talking to you. And God says, if you stop ignoring those times, he, he, he says, I understand, you know, you, you weren't sure if it was God or you. God understands that. He's not mad. Today is God's love. It's not mad at anybody here. But God is saying, when that happens in the future, understand that that's like grade one of him talking to you. And once he sees that you're, you steward the little, which is the, just the, the reminder of scriptures, when he sees you actually like order your, like, you know, let's say, let's say like, you know, you, you have a bad day at work and then, um, you know, you go home, and then you just don't want to talk to anybody. But then, you, but then you, you, you hear the scripture says, "Love your neighbor as yourself." That's not just you have the memory and who cares about it and go home and be ang like that's God saying when you go home, treat your family like you like you like them to treat you. That's Him talking to you. So that's just just an example. So when you when the Holy Spirit reminds you, okay, scripture, it's never you just thinking about scripture. It's Him telling you what's relevant to your situation. And he says, if you if you start to actually like apply those scriptures to your life when you're reminded, he says, then he'll go to grade two of talking to you until eventually you'll you'll hear his voice fluently. So God says, you know, if you're faithful in a few things, the Bible says, he'll reward you with a much. So if you want to hear God better in your life, start not ignoring the the the, the scriptures that pop up to memory. That that's him testing you. And, and if you don't if you don't apply those, he won't go further because he knows that you're not ready. So that, that's a simple that's a simple uh, word for God for anybody here who wants to hear God better. He says, stop ignoring <laughs> those scripture reminders, and you will hear me better. He says. So. So that grace makes us connect with the love of God transforms us into that love, um, conforms us to the image of Christ. That's, see, that's the vision of the grace. And then when it's, when it's perfected, it makes you have a relationship with the Holy Spirit. And when that's perfected, then it makes you love your neighbor as yourself. See, that's the vision. Verse 14 there, uh, 2 Corinthians 13 and 14 that's the full vision of the cross. It's not just about salvation. That's the full vision. Grace is the door to God's love. God's love is the door to the to the fellowship of the Holy Ghost, which is which means the relationship that Adam had with God, and that is the door to actually loving your neighbor like yourself, enemy or friend. So that's the message. Oh, sorry. Very important last point. So. Now, let's look at the cross again. So the Bible, so in the light of what we learned tonight, we're saved by grace. And God is saying that Jesus 
exercised the holiness of grace to save us. Why? Jesus exercised the holiness so because he didn't need he didn't need to repent, right? And we know the Bible says we can come to the throne of grace to receive mercy. He didn't need that. And help in time of need. We see all throughout his life he got the help in time of need. So we're saved by grace. Why? Because Jesus used the grace of the Father, okay, to use that holiness to conquer sin on our behalf, and that's why we're saved. So grace is not just saying, I'm saved by grace. Thank God I did nothing. Yes, you're right. That's only half of it. So you're saved by grace, but that grace is both mercy and it's the power to not sin and to overcome. So we're saved by the power of uh, we're saved by the power of grace that that's holiness in Christ overcame sin, okay, of the whole world, so that now we're saved by that overcoming grace, so that we can both repent when we need to, but even better yet, so we can learn how to you know use and call upon that grace when we need help, so we can be conformed to the image of Christ, so that so that we can learn the culture of heaven. Nobody in heaven goes around saying, sorry, God, and then just goes, okay, I'm saved. <laughs> in heaven, everybody, everybody there is just perfect. Why? See, that's the, that's, that's the vision of the cross. The cross is only the beginning, and that's the end of that vision with the cross. The cross is wonderful, don't get me wrong, but that is, that's this, the final goal of the cross is to, for God to be able to come to earth again and people not dying. <laughs> that, that's the vision of the cross. So we need to stop like just parking at like I'm saved by grace, thank God. Don't stop doing that. But always say, but grace is also the power that will make me to not have to repent as much. Okay, that's the proper way to look at grace. It is mercy, but it's also the power so you can like don't have to ask mercy as much. Okay, Amen. That's the message, Father, in the name of Jesus. I thank you for this message. I pray that this seed, Father, will, will go deep into our hearts and that it will bear uh, much fruit to, to a hundredfold in Jesus' name. Father, I pray right now that you would pluck out in any seeds of sin from our hearts, that you would align us with your kingdom tonight to give us a, a holy impartation of your grace to overcome, Lord, in Jesus' name, because your word says, whatsoever is born of God overcomes the world. So, Lord, help us to overcome sin to overcome um, uh, the bondages of, of all habitual sins so that we can, um, Father, be faithful ambassadors of the kingdom on earth as it is in heaven and truly, Father, manifest the, the virtue of those uh, Holy Ghost fruits unto healing, unto provision, and everything else we need and everything we need to serve you and to love each other as ourselves. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.